Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Holger. It's a pleasure for me being here today. Thanks for joining this session. I think it's, I mean, certainly the most beautiful room in the conference with all these wonderful paintings, and I really love it. And yeah, I also love the topic, so uh, I brought something very exciting to the stage today. So I would like to introduce you about how to model and to visualize and to optimize complex business processes with Kotlin. And I brought a broad variety of processes to the stage today. So I will take you, uh, believe it or not, uh, for a journey to the moon. We are going to establish a, a base on the moon together. I will talk about how we can start a construction business uh, with Kotlin. And I will uh, take you on a deep dive into semiconductor chip production. Before I start, uh, allow me to introduce myself briefly. So I'm kind of an early adopter of Kotlin. So I started using uh, Kotlin basically when it was released. The first day I was already on board. I started a couple of projects. Uh, I worked on a scripting interpreter called KScript. I worked on a data frame library called Krangle. I yeah, uh, started and I'm still supporting a visualization library called Crevice. And most recently, I've started to work on a discrete event simulation uh, library called ColorSim, which is the focus of my topic today. More professionally, I started my career by doing a PhD in machine learning, then I moved to data science. For almost a decade, I studied the questions how cells form tissues. And uh, around 2020, I, I wanted to go for a new challenge, so I joined industry. And what I'm doing professionally is, is I help manufacturing partners to optimize their processes. So we study first how their current processes are organized, and then we try to run their processes more efficiently. And yes, we do this by measuring first certain types of KPIs, but it's all a bit industrial engineering heavy. So allow me to also introduce the topic more from a playful perspective. A very successful genre in all the app stores are simulation games. I mean, you can build shelters or you build medieval castles. You have to set up defenses against zombies. So there's a broad, there's a broad variety. And it's a small, cozy atmosphere. So let's, let's be all honest. Let's do a quick poll. Who of us has played such games more or less recently? Thank you. Yeah, there's quite an interest. I'm also guilty here. So it's also one of my guilty pleasures. But I can even go one step further. First, I get paid for playing it. And the second thing is, I don't play with virtual processes, but I can play with real processes like assembly lines and logistics systems and manufacturing processes, which is a lot of fun. And I would like, you to, I would like to take you on a tour how I approach these type of problems. So typically, we start when we are approached by one of our customers or partners by studying what's actually happening in their production process or in their business process. So we establish the so-called digital twin uh, of the process itself. And that's also the focus of my talk today about how can we build these digital twins of complex processes. Once we have established these digital twin models, we can then consume and use them uh, to explore optimization models and AI models to steer and to govern those processes more efficiently. And later on, we bring those uh, elements, those which work for sure only, back into the real production process. And this is a similar process compared to what some of you may also do when dealing with data in general, because the data science lifecycle looks pretty much the same, so we start by taking data from a real-world process, we clean it up, we transform it, we explore it on a visual level, and then we build certain types of models. And typically in data science, these models are often regression models or machine learning models. But in real-world businesses, the pro uh, processes are often non-linear, they're discrete in nature, they're heavy uh, with respect to data, and they're also highly dynamic. And Regression or machine learning models sometimes are not really compatible with this type of complexities and challenges. So what we can do is we can try to yeah, model our business process. And a very popular idea and approach is to just draw it, to put it on a piece of paper to truly understand how a business works. But this ends up often yeah, in some kind of complex mesh. And it's also often not answering the questions which you may have. So, what is the bottleneck in my business? What would I need to do in order to produce more, in order to serve more customers, to deliver more goods? And also what's often very unclear is what's cause and what's the effects in complex organizations and complex processes. And because I cannot put it 
in better words, I would like to quote Shannon here, the famous American mathematician. So he said, uh, one tool or one approach to study uh, such types of systems is simulation. And he phrased it very nicely. He said that a simulation is a process of designing a model of a real system and conducting experiments with this model for the purpose of understanding the behavior of the system or of evaluating various strategies for the operation of the system. So there's a couple of elements here. So first, there's the level of abstraction. So we for sure cannot I mean, to reflect all details of reality. We have to cut down the bits and pieces which are irrelevant for the dynamics of the system. Then, why do we do it? We do it for two types of uh, uh, insights. First, we want to understand the behavior. And secondly, we would also like to explore strategies to steer or to govern the process more efficiently. And you may wonder, what does this all, how does this all relate to Kotlin? It's because in order to bring this idea of Shannon to life, I have created a library, which you can find on GitHub. It's an MIT licensed uh, project, which allows to build simulation models with Kotlin. And I would like to introduce you how we can do so, and what are the benefits uh, of doing so, and what are also the, the challenges, and what's the typical workflow. So the library is called Kalasim, and it's a discrete event simulator. So it's not a, an engine where you can model continuous, time continuous processes, but it's really meant to the model processes which are discrete in nature. So if I go from here to there, you know, my position has changed. You can model this as a discrete event change. And typically, most business processes can be expressed as uh, discrete event systems. And the beauty of Kalasim is that it's really because it's built on top of the Kotlin language, it provides a statically taped API. We can do dependency injection. We have modern persistence capabilities. We can do structured logging. And we can also automate it pretty well. And when designing the API, the main focus was not just developers. I mean, for sure, you're all welcome to start using it right away. Just pull it from GitHub. But the idea was a bit broader. So the idea was that we can also bring in folks who have not used Kotlin before, like industrial engineers, to provide them some domain-specific language which they can use to model their use cases more efficiently. So how does it work? So let's look at it into a first example. So the idea of this simulation is not to, I mean, do something fancy. It's really meant to introduce the main elements of a simulation which uh, we can build with um, Kalasim. So there's a so-called component, which is something which has some process definition, something which describes how a, a certain entity into the simulation can evolve. We have so-called resources, which are capacity-limited elements. And we have so-called states, which are guards or lock elements. And let's look at an example. So we here we try to model a car. This is pointer work? Not really. Oh, there it is. Perfect. Um, so in order to model a car, we first declare two types of uh, additional elements. So we have the resource up here, which is a driver. So we have a pool of drivers, but we may have fewer drivers than needed. The second thing which we do is we model a traffic light, so something which is initially set here to be red, so probably you should stop there. And then we have the actual uh, component of the simulation, which is the car. And the main idea of Kalasim is that you define a process uh, definition for each simulation component. And here the process is rather simple. So all we do is we request a driver. So this may take time. If no driver is available, the simulation will stall the execution of this process. And once we have a driver, we can then start driving around for some time. Uh, and uh, sooner or later, we will hit a crossing, and then we have to wait for the state variable to change its state into green. And that's essentially it. And once we have declared our components, we can simply spin up the simulation. We say, OK, we have a dependency, which is a traffic light. We have another dependency, which is a driver, which has by default a capacity of one. And then we define a single car. Clearly, this is a simplistic example. But the idea is here we need to introduce the main components. Besides the elements themselves up here, we also have interaction methods that allow us to bring the different entities, the different elements of a simulation together. So how does it work? So it's, as I said, a generic process-oriented discrete event simulation engine. So it's not tied to a specific application, but it's really intended to be applicable to a wide uh, range of business domains. 
simulation entities have a generative process description which we can use to define the interplay with other entities. There's a well-defined and rich process interaction vocabulary to define the interactions of uh, components. What's very important to me is that baked into the API are already endpoints for monitoring and for gathering statistics, from comp for computing statistics, so that we can uh, use the library as it is to understand processes very efficiently. And finally, because it's a simulation engine, there must be an engine part somewhere, there's a so-called event trigger queue that maintains future action triggers and really drives simulation state. And allow me to zoom in onto this last element for a second. It's also the most technical part uh, of the engine. What I have done here is I am building on top of the coroutines API. So we use the sequence builder pattern, which some of you are familiar probably with, in order to model the suspension points in the simulation. Let's look into one example. So here we have a customer, and this is the process definition of this customer. So initially, the customer will just do some shopping. So he, it will, he will do shopping for 30 minutes. And how does this work? In order to do the shopping, um, <clears throat> we create, I mean, the engine will create a suspension, and it will put this component in some kind of queue which is maintained by the simulation engine. And the simulation engine will use this ordered queue in order to process uh, um, future event triggers from the top to the bottom. And later on, after these 30 minutes have been uh, passed in simulation time, obviously not in war time, it will come back to it and will do the rest of it. And because it's all expressed using uh, suspend functions uh, as part of the coroutines API, it's a very natural way which we can now use to write down these process definitions. So let's look into a first more complex example. So let's assume that we want to go to the moon and uh, if some of you are interested in, I mean, uh, exploration and space exploration, you may know that there is ice on the moon, there's water ice. I mean, not much, but there's deposits of water ice. And in order to establish a base on the moon, for sure our astronauts need to yeah, gather water in order to survive. So let's assume that we have built a base over here, and yeah, for sure we bring some initial water to get started with, and then we have a fleet of um, automatic harvesting or mining robots that explore the moon, and which we can control, and whenever they find a deposit, clearly the deposits are hidden at the beginning, they start mining these deposits, and then they will bring the water ice back to the base. It's a race against the time, and that's why it's an interesting process to simulate, because clearly the base will consume water, so it will eventually run out of water if you don't uh, gather um, additional water supplies quickly. So we can model this uh, with the API very nicely, and I'm just showing you one part of the simulation. It's not very long, I think it's just 250 lines in total, but uh, one important aspect is clearly that once we have mined some water ice and we're bringing it back to the base, we need to unload the cargo. So let's just study how this uh, unloading process looks like. First, we have to move to the base, obviously, and then we can change the state of uh, this, uh, um, this robot device to, uh, into unloading. We can then unload the cargo and put all the, uh, the water ice into the refinery of the base itself. And at the very end, we can activate another process, another part of the process definition of this harvesting device. So it will go, then go back searching for new water ice deposits. And so let's jump into the IDE to, to see how this model is actually working. Uh, let me check if this works. Exactly. <clears throat> and so, I mean, the simplest thing is for sure we can just say, okay, we create it and we run it for around maybe 60 days. So let's just try that. And it will, <clears throat> oh, it's over here, so let me move this a bit up. So it did so, and yeah, it says something about produced water units and about the depletion ratio, everything, all deposits have been depleted. But I think you will agree it's a bit boring. So from a result perspective, you know, it's just showing us a number. So, <laughs> I mean, we don't really see much of the dynamics of the system. So what I did is um, I yeah, stepped into your steps uh, from yesterday. Uh, where you presented us how you used Open Render uh, to, as a rendering engine to showcase what is actually happening in the models. So I don't know if uh, all of you are familiar with Open Render, but uh, let me jump here. So it's 
Um, another Kotlin API, which is more meant for artistic types of applications, but we can also bring it here very easily, and that's what I did. So I added on top of the simulation model uh, a visualization of it. So um, essentially, it's, it's also not much code. I mean, given the, the result, I'm actually very happy with the complexity of what we had to do here. So in total, I think it's yeah, not even 200 lines of code, so I think it's doable from an efforts perspective. And if you run uh, this wrapper on top of the um, um, lunar mining application, we can now study the dynamics of the system. So let's go into it and let's look into what's happening. So we see how the rovers start exploring the surface of the moon, and uh, once uh, yeah, after a while, they find water ice deposits. They start mining them, and then you can see the loading and the unloading status. You so see how they move the cargo back to the base, and you also see the constant struggle for survival at the base because it's consuming water. So the question is, what is far faster, fight, finding water ice or dying a slow death in the base? And with this, we complemented our simulation very nicely, but just adding this rendering layer on top of it, we can really now study the dynamics uh, of our business process, if you want to say so, uh, in order to see what's happening. And then for sure, we can also use this to size our mission so we can decide about how many rovers do we actually need and what is the distribution of our water ice deposits. So I think now we can really prepare our mission properly. And let's jump back. No, sorry. Yes. As I said at the beginning, I mean, I really became a data, assist, uh, data scientist over the last decade. So doing the rendering is not my area of expertise. So I think if there's some game developer or some artist uh, here, I think you'll say, OK, it looks OK-ish. And indeed, it just looks OK-ish. Because my focus is always in KPIs. So if I have such a system, I want to just see numbers. I don't, I mean, I like the visuals, but what I really focus on is, I mean, doing analytics with such systems. So I want to reduce it to aggregate the statistics. I want to do comparative analysis and so on. And that's really the focus also what I have baked into the Kaladim library. So it comes along with various means to study uh, simulation ones. So there's an event block. Uh, we have monitors to track state and statistics of all the elements which I have presented earlier. And it also comes uh, along with certain types of visualization already baked into the library, and I will show some examples later. Before we go into the next example, I would know the track diet, maybe because the focus is not there. No. Let's restart the um, presentation. Does it work now? Yes, now it works. OK, uh, I would like to introduce you to another use case. It's actually a very complex use case because it's a real world one. I mean, the lunar mining was fun to introduce you to the concepts, but I also want to give you an idea about what, what we actually do with it. And the example I'm going to present is uh, from semiconductor production optimization. So some of you may be familiar with the general process. So it's a highly complex industry. Typically, it takes around six months for a raw wafer to enter a factory into, uh, for, for being uh, produced into an actual computer chip. There's more than 1,000 steps involved. And technically, what you do is you build, um, I mean, kind of a 30-floor skyscraper with nanometer precision on top of the raw wafer. So it's, it's a mind-blowing, compl mind complex process. And we have partners. Oh, this pointer died again. OK. Yes, uh, we have various partners in the semiconductor industry, and uh, here we teamed up with a company called Nexperia. They have a wonderful fab in Hamburg, in Germany, and they produce in this factory alone more than a billion devices per year. And they're still concerned about throughput, so clearly it's also very cost, uh, I mean, a very expensive type of production, so they always think about measures and ways to improve their operation. And one very critical step in the production process in Hamburg is the so-called epitaxy. In epitaxy, what you do is you grow crystalline layers uh, on top of a raw silicon wafer. And this is really a rate-limiting step uh, for the production in Hamburg, because doing this crystal, crystal growth on top of a wafer 
takes around 15 minutes per wafer, which seems not that long, but it's, it's, a, it's a long process, believe me. So they are really curious about uh, ways to improve the operations of this work center where they perform this type of physical process. So we teamed up with them and uh, we modeled the entire Epitaxy work center with ColorSim and Kotlin. So we've not just modeled the tools, but also all the complementary processes like maintenance, like pre and post AP activities, the control mechanisms like dispatching and scheduling uh, they, they do in order to govern and to steer the process. And yeah, we modeled quite a few uh, elements as well. And what we can then do with such models, we can really study its dynamics. So we can study, for instance, what the operators are doing. So as you can see here on the left panel, we modeled the activities of the operators on a rather detailed level. So we model their breaks, when they repair tools, when they change between shifts, when they do transportation and so on. What we also modeled was the maintenance planning. In particular in semiconductor, it's very important to ensure that tools are in a good shape. So they perform an insane amount of maintenance and qualification activities which we modeled in this particular uh, simulation example. And with this model, we can then study the dynamics of the processes. So here we see for the different epitaxy reactors, which are big tools, they are as big as a room, we can see what tools are doing. And indicated in color, we also see when tools are not doing anything. Like we have this light blue standby no product, which is a state where a tool is simply idle because there's nothing to be produced which is clearly something you want to avoid at all costs. So we were in, uh, studying, okay, how can we, I mean, govern and uh, steer this process more efficiently? So we studied root causes for standby. And uh, without going into too much detail, there's different ways uh, a tool can, un can end up in a standby state. So it could wait for qualification, it could wait for material, but it could also wait for the operator to simply switch the on button. And we figured that in, Hamburg, it's essentially an understaffed area. So they have too, little, too few operators on the shop floor in order to run their tools. And it's also very hard for them to hire new personnel. So we thought, OK, how can we support them? How can we support the operator to, I mean, yeah, free some time? And we figured that they spend actually quite some time uh, with this question about what to do next because it's a complex process, so it really takes them five minutes on average for a single wafer cassette uh, to decide, okay, what, what should I do next? So we did the experiment with our simulation model, what would happen if we would introduce some automatic planning solution, which simply does this decision for the operator, so it reduces the degrees of freedom to one, so it simply says, you take this dot cassette next. And by doing so, we can free not much just a few minutes of time for the operator. But if he simulates the process with all its beauty and details, we see that on average in a 14-day uh, window with a lot of repetition and um, control randomization, we gain on average a 5% throughput increase, which is a lot of improvement, I mean, given the complexity of the process. And clearly, by increasing the throughput by 5%, we help our partners here to make uh, quite a considerable amount uh, of more money. Here we were able to suggest a rather simplistic improvement to the existing process. So we said, OK, if you automate the decision of the operator, you can produce more. You can make more money. Very often, it's not that simple. So very often, it's really needed to use a more sophisticated type of uh, machinery in order to steer processes. So let's talk a bit about process optim optimization and how we can bind this with simulation. And I think this is really a, a crucial point if you're really serious about making more money because very often the decision mechanisms in many businesses are simplistic. So you sort a list and then you take the thing from the top. But uh, very often, that's not the most efficient and not the most optimist strategy. Because very often, there's competing objectives. So there's not just one goal, one objective you want to achieve. But I always like this uh, idea of showing this as a radar chart, where we have different business objectives as different dimensions. And you can really intuitively imagine it in a way that if you pull on one edge, you know, 
the whole polygon will move together into your direction, but you lose, uh, I mean, some performance on another KPI dimension. So the question is really, okay, how can I balance these conflicting business objectives? And this is a tricky thing, so there's no easy answer, also from a technical perspective, uh, if you want to, uh, I mean, establish this. And in order to evaluate if it makes sense for a business to use a more complex type of optimization, we can use simulation again. So we can really take a, an optimization engine, like a solver, a constraint solver, and combine it with our simulation model to explore the dynamics and the benefits of doing so in a risk-free environment. And an engine which uh, I like to use very often is OptaPlanner. It's a library, it's a JVM library supported by Red Hat. And it's uh, yeah, really designed as a framework which you can use to model a wide range of optimization problems. And it's intended to be used from uh, the JVM and from, from in Java mainly, but I have to say it's actually much easier to do this using Kotlin. And it's so easy that I can put it onto two slides. So the first step you need to do in order to build an optimization a model with OptaPlanner is you build your so-called, or you define your so-called planning solution. So you simply write down your domain model. So here's the idea is we want to optimize a taxi business. So we want, to, uh, we want to do transportation of passengers. And to make it a bit more exciting, the idea is that we can pull different requests from customers so that if two people are from the same part of the city going to the same direction, they may drive some part of the way together. So we can simply write this down. We can say, okay, we have these requests, uh, we have uh, jobs, and we have some score, which is this balanced um, 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 function where we bring the different objectives together. And a, simple, a single transport job is then modeled as a list of customer requests, <clears throat> and it's bound by certain properties, such as capacity. And with this model in place, what we then can do is we can define so-called constraints. So we define how we should rate a given solution. And clearly there's so-called hard constraints, so certain aspects which you need to fulfill. For instance, in this case, we need to make sure that the total number of passengers per vehicle does not exceed its capacity. And typically, you don't have just one constraint, but you add a few constraints depending on your business requirements. And with these two components in place, we can then solve a complex planning problem. So we can say, okay, I want to configure it, I build a so-called solver instance for my domain problem, it's all generic APIs, and then I can simply solve it. And this model is very compatible to how the simulation works. So we can really take such a solution and bundle it with a simulation to really explore the dynamics of a more complex uh, planning process. A third use case, which I think is very interesting, and many of our customers are doing this, is they use simulation for predictive analytics. They want to do something like a demand forecast, or they want to know, okay, what is the material accumulation in my assembly line next week or next day? And uh, with ColorSim, we can also do this type of prediction. So if you assume that we have some business we can at any time prepare a forecast, and we for sure we can prepare, prepare the forecast for the business as it is. We can prepare, we uh, can compute certain KPIs of interest. But what we can also do is we can do a so-called scenario analysis. We could study, okay, what would happen if we would hire more staff or if we would buy more machines? So how would this change our business forecast? So let me recap the idea here. So the idea is really that we always start with some optimization goal. So we have a business process and we want to make it more efficient. We want to produce more, we want to use fewer resources, whatever. And with this goal in mind, we can then approach the actual process and we have first need to study it. We need to write down a more formal description about what's happening. And uh, with this description at hand, we can then go and implement this description into a simulation model. What's always needed is to then double check if the simulation dynamics actually match the dynamics of the real process. And typically they don't do this in the first iteration. So typically it takes some time and iteration and more interviews with the, the people involved to actually figure the dynamics and the interplay of, of um, actors in the process in order to get the simulation dynamics right. 
But once we have made sure that our simulation is giving good prediction accuracy, we can then start with the fun part. We can start putting numbers to ideas. So what would happen if we do this, or if we do that, or if we steer the process differently? Then we can really go this, this orange path, so we can study uh, in a risk-free environment what-if analysis. And with Kalasim library, we can do this very nicely and easily using Kotlin now. So let's look into another, and it's also my final example. So let's pretend that we want to build an elevator system. You know, I mean, you all know it from a hotel, you're waiting in front of the elevator and it's not coming, and you wonder, okay, why do they have, why have they sized it that way that I have to wait for a minute? So let's look into this example, and uh, as always, we have to start with a process description. So let's pretend here that there's N lifts which we want to uh, build, and passengers arrive with different rates, which is also a floor-dependent thing. Mostly at the ground floor, most people will arrive, and at the upper floors, maybe not so few passengers will uh, um, request a, um, a car. And then, clearly, everything has a speed, so the cars have a speed, they need to open and close the door, so there's a couple of processes to be considered here. And yeah, with such a model in mind, we can ask different questions. So we can really ask, okay, how can we size such a system? How many cars do we need? What is the optimal capacity? So how does this correlate with the number of floors of the build I'm going to build? And yeah, or what would be the impact of overhauling the engine so that the cars drive a bit faster? So how would this change the dynamics of the system? And in order to answer this question, I would jump back to the IDE and Yes, so it's another model um, which you can also find on GitHub, so it's all public examples. Elevator. Yes. Uh, ah. And uh, yeah, it's also not that much code, but I think it's a bit pointless to now read through 200 lines of code together with you. I mean, Feel free to do this by yourself, or please also approach me if you struggle. But what we can always do, and I think this is also an advantage of using something like Kotlin to build simulation models, we can simply visualize the structure of the model very easily. So we can simply pick the main elements and say, okay, please uh, give me some um, visualization of the model. We can throw in a few components like uh, the dependencies between the uh, different elements. Oops, up, now I was too fast. And then we can potentially lay this out once more. And then we can very nicely, oh, now we have to click that button. And then we can see very nicely what's, what's happening here. So we have the cars modeled as something that has a process because they need to go up and down. So they clearly need some description within our simulation model about how to behave. We have generative processes producing new passengers, which are called visitors in this context, which are, I mean, arriving at the different floors independently. And clearly then we have this process of opening the doors, closing the doors, and uh, everything is bound by capacities because uh, every car can just uh, transport a given number of passengers at the same time only. And the same idea which we discussed earlier applies here as well. So it's very boring, actually, to run this uh, model here in the IDE. We can do this, but hmm, I mean, it's just giving us a single number. So and it's not impressive to anyone. I mean, not to the analyst who wants to study the system dynamics, and also not to the manager who wants to understand about the, the general sizing strategy here. So uh, what I did here is the same as I did for the lunar um, um, mining mission. So I have used Open Render again to put a, an interface on top of the simulation. And this time I went one step further. So I thought, OK, with the lunar mining, it was more static video. So there, was, there were no interactive controls. But one beautiful aspect of Open Render is you can also expose parameters. You can have sliders and checkboxes. So I thought, OK, let's do this. Let's really build a digital twin of the process where we can manipulate the process properties live and to study its dynamics. So let's try to start that as well. Elevator. Um, so one second. 
second. Oops. Okay. Let's try that. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, while it's doing it, so down here we just see, I mean, the statistics it was printing when just running in it as a terminal application, but yeah, as we discussed, it's a, yeah, not really satisfactory to do it that way. Oh, we still have the lunar mining running, so let's close this. Um, and yeah, here we are. So welcome to the office tower. So we see the different uh, cabs or cars. I think the correct English term is cars. I mean, I would call it cabin, but as I looked it up. It's, it's on internet said it's a car. Uh, and we also can see how passengers are lining up on the different floors. So we really can study the system dynamics of our elevator system here. And as you can see on the left side of the application of our digital twin solution, if you want to say so, we can see the different system parameters. So let's just play around with it a bit. So first thing which we can do is we can, I mean, play with the number of floors. So I mean, this was a very high building, but we can say, okay, I mean, nine floors is also a decent size. And then whenever we touch any of the controls, it will restart the simulation. And then we can also model the number of elevators. So we could say, okay, maybe, yeah, maybe we should go for this number of elevators. And we can also model the car capacity so that we can squeeze in more passengers into each car. But yeah, let's maybe bring this down a bit. And then we most importantly can also play with the arrival rate. So how many passengers will arrive? And we have two different rates which we control, can control here. So the ground floor arrivals, which is this one. And then we have also the, I mean, inner building arrivals, which basically is about passengers that want to go from one floor to another one. And then we can also model or modulate the simulation speed just to see how things are going. And I hope you agree that with this type of rendering on top of our basic simulation model, we can really study system dynamics very easily. And I hope I could also give you some idea about, I mean, that this is not something which is just for the moon or for office buildings, but it's really meant as a general mechanism to describe processes within an organization and to really study, okay, how can we run them more efficiently? As a last element, I would like to pick up uh, what we have learned yesterday in the keynote. So I was really amazed when I entered the keynote. The first thing they put on the stage was Kotlin notebooks. So it was not multi-platform, it was not uh, mobile, it was notebooks. And I'm be really a big fan of notebooks because they allow for a very interactive and very easy exploration of ideas and of APIs. And clearly, with such a simulation, I'm, I mean, a notebook feels like a very natural environment to work with these type of models. So let's study our elevator model using the notebook API. And um, uh, the, I mean, when the, yesterday when they presented it, uh, I thought, okay, I give it a try right away, and it did not work. So thank you very much to Roman and Ilya from JetBrains helping me to set up some EAP build here on my computer so that I can showcase this new feature which we saw as a, as a video yesterday uh, as part of a live demonstration. So let's switch to this one. So here we have the, the repo, so all the sources and also the elevators should be hanging around somewhere here. Uh, and the beauty of it is now that we don't have to declare any dependencies because, as I explained it yesterday, uh, dependencies from the projects are automatically wired into the notebook context. So we can start right away by importing some classes. And in this case, we don't want to do much. All we want to do is we want to uh, import the elevator itself uh, and yeah, essentially some bits of the ColorSim APIs. And let's yeah, keep our fingers crossed that the demo will work out. I mean, yes, it looks good. I mean, let's ignore these IDE errors for now. I mean, it's part of the EAP process, so I think they will all go away very soon. And now we can, yeah, we can really 
do what industrial engineers tend to do. We can explore the, the process dynamics of our system, so we can set up a simulation, uh, uh, which is this elevator model with four cars, and there's more parameters, but let's just keep it simple here. And then we can run the model for 24 hours, and so you don't have to be afraid, it's not wartime. So we're not talking about that we have to stay for one day here in the room, it's all about simulation time, and it's, it's very quick, so we did it, and so, okay, one day has passed in the simulation world. We can quickly check the status of the model, and it's rendering by default as a JSON structure. We see the current time in the model. We see the, the um, event queue, which is maintained by the engine. And then we can start right away studying characteristics and dynamics of our process here. So what we can do is we can pull, for instance, the individual cars from the model and check out uh, properties that we could check um, the number of visitors in the first car, and we can pull them out and we can visualize them uh, just with one line of code in a very integrated and uh, well-defined environment. So let's just try another example, just to illustrate the idea uh, once more. Oh, I have to scroll here. And I have four minutes to go, but I think I'm well on track. So we can, as I said, uh, ColorZim provides various statistics endpoints. So we can pull, for instance, the, I mean, median and the mean and some quantiles for certain key metrics of our simulation model. But we can also pull them out and we uh, all learned this term yesterday in case you we haven't used it before. We can shape them into so-called data frame, which is a tabular structure. So let's build this data frame and, oh, I have to trust the notebook. Let's see if this works. Um, so. This is my, here, yes, so I've trusted the notebook. It's my own one, so it was an easy choice. And then we can see this data frame. And yeah, lastly, we can for sure take this tabular structure, and here there's not too much data. So all I wanted to extract is the mean uh, utilization of the different cars in our elevator system. Uh, no, no, sorry, no, no, no. I was, this data frame is about the average queue length on the various floors in our model. And then we can take this data because it's a bit hard to read through this table and yeah, just render it as another uh, chart to really study system dynamics. So as we can see here on the ground floor, I mean, we have the longest queues on average with almost one person permanently waiting in front of the elevator system. And then it's yeah, um, a matter of a business decision whether this is good enough or whether we may want to size our uh, elevator system a bit uh, better so that waiting times can be reduced. All right, so let me recap. Uh, I hope I could give you an overview about how we can use Kotlin to do discrete event simulation. So with ColorSim, we can cover quite a range of use cases. We can study how to optimize processes. We can use the simulation engine also to enable AI research. For instance, if you build so-called reinforcing reinforcement learning AI models, you need a simulation environment in which you can train the AI. We can use this uh, idea to study uh, bottleneck processes. What we haven't covered today, but I think that's also an extremely important, uh, I mean, application is integration testing. I think most of you are familiar with the idea of mocking some component in a complex system. But all these mock APIs, I mean, you sooner or later hit the wall with them if the complexity of your system grows. What we can do is we can build a simulation with ColorSim in order to mock a more complex process, and then we can bind this to our actual application in order to test it. We can use the system, as we just did, to do capacity planning, as in our elevator example. And clearly, we can also use it just for the fun of it. And with this, uh, I would just like to give you one pointer, I mean, and maybe also an idea about what's next for me on my personal agenda. So what's still missing in the uh, library is an, the ability to save simulation state, so that really to freeze an entire simulation and to uh, run, rerun it later. And what's uh, blocking us here is that uh, in the coroutines API, the continuation objects, which some of you, I guess, are familiar with, are not yet serializable. So we cannot simply save the entire thing to disk and come back to it later. Also, I think the animation API, I showed you two examples, it works very nice, it's not too much effort, but I think it could be streamlined for new users uh, in some ways. Also, I would like to dig a bit deeper into um, agent-based modeling, which is a fascinating topic. 
And I give you some ideas about this process mining API, which we can easily consume from a notebook uh, uh, these days. And finally, I think yeah, there are still some demos lacking in the repo regarding Opta Planner and also Google OR tools, which I'm yeah, still uh, preparing at the moment. And, but clearly, the, the biggest fun and also what's, what's uh, actually the top of the agenda is to use the library uh, to help others making more money and yeah, run their businesses more efficiently. What could be the next step for you? You could go to the website. There's an example section, and there we have a broad variety of examples. So we have ferrymen shipping people from one bank to the other. We have philosophers, I mean, sitting around a table trying to eat. We have, uh, yeah, movie theaters, banks. I mean, lots of things which are fun examples just to get into the mood and to get into the API. And with this, I would like to thank you for joining my presentation. Uh, I hope I give you, could give you an idea about how we use simulation uh, more in an industrial manufacturing context. And clearly, we do this not just with love, but we do this also more and more uh, using Kotlin. Thanks for being here. Don't forget to vote. If you want to reach out, you can find me on Kotlin Slack. You can uh, reach me via email, GitHub for sure, and also LinkedIn. I deposit all the source examples already in the repo, and I will also share the slides in the repository very soon. Thanks for being here.